Stefan Kinsella, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. So we're going to talk about your class for the Mises Academy on intellectual property. Yes, um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we've been planning it for quite a while, as you know, and um, um, I think it's the first course will be on November 1st, six weeks, and we'll take a week off. And we will have time to go in depth into many of the uh, issues uh, about intellectual property and uh, its relationship to libertarianism, economic theory, and uh, various other areas. Why is this an important issue? Well, it's becoming a more more and more important issue, um, as we've seen in our circles uh, and as, um, as seen on the Internet uh, daily. We, we see horror stories and uh, crazy examples of uh, abuses of IP. Um, and people are starting to wonder if, if it's really an abuse of IP or if it's there's something wrong with IP itself. And, um, you know, in, in the past, economists uh, or free market economists and libertarians have sort of uh, given this issue a pass. They've sort of taken it for granted. It's been in a corner all by its by, by itself. And uh, now people are wondering, and, and as we start looking more closely at it, we can see that a lot of the assumptions um, about IP have been wrong. Right. Well, it's striking you mentioned the history of thought here and why this issue is sort of crystallizing in our time, and especially with your your pioneering uh, monograph book on that subject against intellectual property. Um, but you know, it's 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 generally true, isn't it, that that the theoretical element of of economics or law or whatever uh, catches up when the practical uh, the need for that th new theory comes along. For example, I mean, uh, <coughs> theory of money and credit was made necessary. Book, Mises' book, theory of money and credit, was made necessary by the advent of central banking. For mm -hmm. example, so 50 years ago, IP wasn't that wasn't that big a deal. Yeah, I think that's completely true. Um, I mean, you know, Mises said something I've always loved. He, everyone focuses on a few of his statements that other people don't see because he's got so many great little aphorisms and things. But one thing he said I've always loved was he, he pointed out that, um, you know, in his view, economics is um, purely deductive reasoning from a priori sort of categories, right? Plus, then you explicitly introduce certain assumptions to make it interesting, Right, interesting was something that I always focused on. Mm. So, in other words, um, you know, we we could talk hypothetically about a barter society forever, but it won't get us that far. So let's let's introduce the assumption that okay, let's assume there is money in society. Once you assume that, now that's not a priori that there is money, but there could be money, and if there is, then certain things follow from it. Right. So I think likewise uh, in libertarian theory, um, you know, it becomes in certain things become interesting at a certain point. And now, um, I, th I think in the past there was, um, uh, as you mentioned in your talk yesterday here at the um, at Supporter Summit, um, it, you know, it, it was not as easy as it, as it is now to replicate information, right? So there was sort of a tie in previous times between a, a good that was produced, like a book, let's say, and the information in it. You know, the, the information in the book was in the physical copy of the book. Um, so you could easily find a way to sell that. But now with information being so easy to, to copy, and of course, as Cory Doctorow mentions in one of his articles and speeches, um, do we think we're going to uh, get to a point where it's going to be less less easy to copy things? Is it going to is it going to get uh, harder to copy and to spread information? No, it's only going to get easier. So these things have made um, uh, people have to confront the issue of the morality and the politics of sharing information. And it's not only a technological advance, it's also uh, dramatic changes in policy that have occurred over the last uh, 15, 20 years. Yes, um, copyright and patent keep getting uh, worse. Uh, the, the Western countries are twisting the arms of uh, emerging economies like China to adopt a sort of draconian um, Western-style intellectual property. This uh, ACTA, this treaty that's coming up, is 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 terrible. It would it would it probably will be passed and it will impose uh, protections ar around the world similar to what we have in the U.S. and the DMCA Digital Millennium yeah. Copyright Act. Is this enforced by the so-called World Intellectual Property Organization? The, the WTA will have a role in it. Yes. The W. The WTA is World Trade Organization, yeah. and the WIPO is the WIPO. is is the World Intellectual Property Organization. I'm not sure their their relationship. But it's to the this. UN. Yeah, right. So you've got really 
a kind of an international teeth growing here. Correct. Right. And a prospect for uh, unbelievable abuse. And you know what's striking about this? <clears throat> to me, here you have a sector of vast state expansion and imposition on individual liberty. And it's occurring in the name of property rights. Right. This is what is, um, uh, what is striking when you start looking at this. You'll see that even libertarians for a long time have regarded patent and copyright as types of property rights. So they sort of assume that this is part of the property rights panoply we should respect. You know, it's in the American Constitution. Yeah, I should say, I, I always assume that, too. I mean, uh, yeah. unquestioned, but really. But when you look at the history of it, I mean, copyright, the origins of copyright lies in censorship, literal censorship. Basically, they were afraid of the menace of printing, mm. right? Because now the church and the government couldn't control so easily the distribution of what thoughts were officially to be promulgated to people. Right. And so the roots England, of copyright yeah. is in censorship, literally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the roots of, of patents... Uh, this is something um, I'll mention in the in the speech um, at the supporter summit, um, and I was mentioning to you the other day. But um, ironically, the origins of patents are in piracy, uh -huh. literally in piracy. Nowadays, you hear the defenders of IP um, attack so-called pirates, right? And of course, as you and I have discussed, they're not pirates at all because real pirates kill people and break things and take things from you, make right. you worse off, right? <laughs> IP pirates don't do that. Well, one of the or original uses of what's called a letters patent was a grant to uh, Sir Fran – I don't want to call Francis Drake Sir. He was a slaver after all. Yeah. Uh, Francis Drake was became a privateer, which is nothing but a legalized pri pirate. He went around the world uh, using this uh, these letters patent granted to him by the Queen of England to 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 to, to plunder and to steal – and to bring the treasures back home. Uh -huh, uh -huh. He was literally a pirate mm -hmm. authorized by a patent. Right. So patents and piracy do go hand in yeah. hand, actually. Now, a lot of this history is being unearthed, only, again, only recently, uh, because it, it, uh, because the, the changes in technology, the intensification of the law, have, have, have caused people now to look more carefully at the foundations of something that was previously largely unquestioned. Although... Hayek had some passages in his work that were explicitly against copyright yes. and and patent. Uh, of course, Rothbard Rothbard's, uh, was was against patents. He had a clear statement and uh, his views of copyright. Uh, they were common. He was in favor of so-called common law copyright, which is more or less a, a free market position. Right. And uh, Mises provides enough good reason to. Yeah. Uh, to question the whole idea that you could have ownership and uh, the ideas, in fact, I think it's pretty clear that he didn't believe you could own ideas. Really. Right. Yeah. Right. So you have you have these these strains in the Austrian tradition, and of course, it's not only the Austrian tradition that matters here. I mean, it's just the Austrians have been the ones that have done the most serious thought about it, right? Yeah, and I, and I, I do think, um, uh, in thinking hard about this issue myself, I have noticed that uh, having an Austrian background. Uh, as usual, helps to see these issues more clearly. Uh, it, it's helped me in legal theory and other areas, but here, here especially, and and you can see why Mises, even though he didn't devote a lot of attention to this issue, um, he didn't go off track too far because his right. focus on the structure of human action kept him from doing that. He saw the role of ideas was a guide to human action. It was not the means of action. The means of action are scarce resources which have to be economized, right? But Mises saw that human action is guided by ideas. So he, he, he glimpsed, although he didn't unfold it too much, uh, he glimpsed that ideas, uh, and as you mentioned in your speech, um, cannot be destroyed, they can last forever, they're infinitely reusable. Malleable. Yes, so he, and they're malleable, um, which also I guess Hayek would see as well with his uh, emphasis on tacit knowledge. Isn't it great too? I, uh, the Mises says, "Look, ideas are not phantoms; they're real things." They are things. <laughs> yeah, and I think the mistake that is made by sort of crude philosophizing by a lot of libertarians is they'll say, "Well, if it's a thing, you can then it can be owned." Well, well yeah. thingness is not the criteria for for yeah. ownability, uh -huh, right? Uh -huh. uh, there's something else in what just scarcity or something like that. Yeah. Um, it's not it's not to denigrate their importance, and a lot of um, utilitarian-minded people. Just assume that if you are skeptical about intellectual property, then you are anti-intellectual or you're hostile to the role of ideas. 
And of course, it's the other way around. Yeah. Intellectual property hampers innovation. Intellectual yeah. property literally imposes censorship on people. It literally uh, prevents you from using knowledge that you have. Um, so basically, getting rid of IP, the, 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 one of the goals there is to enhance innovation and to enhance intellectual freedom. Yeah, make the whole, make every industry work the way the fashion industry has has managed to uh, uh, live and thrive without IP. Absolutely, and we're used to that now. Although there's there's always agitation to impose IP even on those areas. Well, sure, and and you know, if I were Calvin Klein, I would probably favor it. I, absolutely, you know? and um, that's why we have to get the word out there yeah. and, and and inform people. <laughs> But there has been a great interest in this, and um, as you as you notice, whenever we post on this on the Mises blog, it gets some of the most comments. People are just repeatedly fascinated and interested in this issue. Yeah. So you know, we thought it was time to explore this issue in depth, to go into the history yeah. of it, how it emerged, and also just to explain exactly what IP is in the modern law. Right. Uh, most laymen get this confused all the time. I'm a practicing patent lawyer, so I'm always explaining to people. No, that's a co- that's not a copyright. That's a trademark. No, that's not a trade secret. That's a patent because they get these things confused, and uh, it's it's of course especially bad when you're advocating IP and you don't really even know what you're talking about. Right. Sure. But if you want to think about it critically and understand it um, and even be critical of it, you do need to understand exactly what the legal system. What's so is. wonderful about this topic is not just that well, it's a, it's, an, it's a topic we need to urgently understand, but but to take on the the topic of IP helps us think more seriously about the foundations of of social thought and economic thought I, um, I, issues like property yes. ideas uh, how society emerges what e- economic development yes. it it seems like it's a bridge to understanding in a more vivid way almost every other area yeah if it, it forces you economy. to focus um, on the foundations of, of economics and Austrian economics so the structure of human action right. means and ends what scarcity means the role of ideas emulation even some of Hayek's um, knowledge-based arguments um, and also in terms of libertarianism it forces you to clarify your thinking on various other areas such as causation and especially contract theory where again Rothbard was so um, insightful, and it basically between the three thinkers that you mentioned, Hayek and Rothbard Mises. I think Rothbard, of course, was was the overall the best on on IP. Um, unfortunately, he only gave it a little bit of attention. I, if he had only devoted more attention to it, I mean, I think he thought it was a fairly obvious issue. He dealt with it. He put it aside. Yeah, well, again, it was 40 years ago when the issue wasn't that wasn't that right. Uh, and if, I'm sure that if if the issue had been more um, more important at the time, he, he he could have devoted more time to it and. Because his contract theory leads naturally to a correct view of IP as well. His contract theory is this the title transfer theory of contract, which is based upon the work of Williamson Evers. Right. So this idea of contract and Rothbard's really clear idea of what property rights are. Right. I mean, Rothbard was one of the first to see that it's a little bit misleading to talk about um, these derivative rights as as independent rights, like the right to free speech. I mean, mm-hmm. there's a right to property. Right, mm-hmm. and so Rothbard, for example, was able to reject um, reputation rights because he saw mm. that that means owning someone else's brain, basically, because right. that's what your reputation is, yeah. what other people think right. about you. So Rothbard's clear focus on property rights as the foundational right led him to 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 say be clear on on reputation rights, which I believe is a type of IP right as well. This has sure, got the sure. same argument. No, it's all linked. Right. It's all linked, right? Um, it's just a type of intellectual property. Yeah. It's probably the third worst, I would say, next to patent and copyright. Right. Um, and so Rothbard's contract theory also is crucial to having the proper view of intellectual property because otherwise you come up with these kind of um, uh, fuzzy contract-based arguments for right. intellectual property. Right. Um, and unless you view property as or contracts as transfers of title, which Rothbard did, you you cannot uh, reject respond properly to that kind of argument. Right here, here again is an area of of. Uh libertarian thought or uh, political economy in general that, that people just don't often think about. You know, it's something you read past, you go, okay, what does it really matter whether you accept this or that view of contract, really? Right. And so, well, it turns out it does matter. One small mistake and suddenly you've got a, a calamity yes. on your hands. Yeah. And of course, <laughs> of course, almost every year there's, a, there's some political debate about reforming copyright and patent law, yeah. uh, one way or the other. Uh, there's 
reform, agitation to reform it, to improve its efficiency, to uh, maybe reduce the harshness of patent law. Uh, and But then there's always the pressure to increase the protections, increase sure. the term, impose the act of, uh, make it more world, worldwide, improve, increase its scope, uh, add IP to fashion. So these debates are always there in the public arena, and we do need to be informed about the, the morality and the economics of these issues. Yeah, I worry to too in. about about the the huge thicket that's being created, not just nationally but internationally, uh, that's going to hamper economic development in the future. I mean, even in the area of, of software, we've seen how uh, this this kind of regulation is is causing. Uh, serious delays in development. Yeah. I mean, that's what it ends up happening, just slowing down development. Of course, if you consistently enforced IP across the board, you could really literally bring the whole world to a standstill, couldn't Absolutely. you? Absolutely. And I mean, there's um, um, there's there's always pressure for, for the emerging economies like China, for example, to adopt American-style IP. Now, China is improving, more or less, as, we, as far as we can tell, um, in general, right? Their property rights are getting better. Their economy is improving. And, uh, you know, if, if they adopt this Western mentality that if they're going to become capitalist, they need to adopt a strong IP system, this could actually impede their growth, yeah, right? Yeah. It could trap capital, for example. Yeah. It, could, it, could, it could hamper innovation. Over By the way, there. I should tell you, there's a guy here from, uh, from China who told me that all the stuff about IP rights in China is for designed for uh, con, uh, the consumption of Americans and, yeah. and English newspapers. That, uh, In fact, that the, one of the major reasons for uh, China's growth right now is the, the almost practical, complete absence of, of all intellectual yes. property. So that, that, I was yeah, intrigued to hear that. I had a discussion with him as well. Yeah. Um, he's, he was interesting. He had some good comments. And... Uh, uh, that's my sense as well. Um, I, I work for a company that has a Chinese and a Taiwanese operation, and and my sense is that um, uh, they are not really coming along as much as is being presented, but they are coming along to some degree, and that does concern me. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it would be interesting to have, um, and, and, and as part of this course, I may do some more research to 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 expose exactly the role of innovation, say in China, to see. How the lack of IP there is helping right. them too. So we can uncover lots of things. But this is an course. exciting thing to have a full course devoted to the subject. Now, how many weeks? Are we six. We're going to do six, six weeks. weeks. Yeah. And and it's an example of something the Mises Academy can offer that that cannot uh, that you can't find in a conventional uh, learning environment at the local university or whatever. You're not going to be able to take a class on IP from anybody who really knows anything. You are uh, one of the acknowledged experts in the whole world on the topic, and here you are offering a class for anybody in the world who's interested in learning about it. Now, what if somebody says, um, well, look, I, I just don't accept this. Uh, Stefan is a well-known radical advocate of eliminating intellectual property. I don't agree with him. So why should I take his class? Well, he can, he, he can learn a lot of um, things about economics, about libertarian theory. He can learn why their skepticism? Some people can hone their arguments. You know, in the in the comments threads on the Mises blog, uh, there is repeatedly the same types of questions raised over and over and over and over again, and that's useful and that's helpful. But it's in print and sometimes a personal dialogue. You know, these people can ask their questions and I can respond mm. in person, mm -hmm. right? Um, also, uh, you know, uh, we can at least clarify our position because in the mainstream world. There's sort of this idea that people that are opposed to intellectual property are, are leftists, right? They're hostile to property in general. Mm. So we can at least clarify, no, there's at least a pro-property reason to be opposed to so-called IP for the reason that it is actually uh, – it undercuts property rights. It infringes property rights. Mm -hmm. So it will be educational. I will go into the history of it. The history is just fascinating. Um, and if you are in favor of IP – you can at least see all the different arguments offered and maybe uh, uh, find what some of the holes are in your arguments, see what work you need to do. For example, most people at least implicitly have a utilitarian argument for intellectual property. Even, even Ayn Rand, basically her argument was utilitarian, Yes. which is why she uh, wanted a finite term for copyrights instead of an infinite term. right? Um, and the utilitarians, they, they always say that they're in favor of – IP because it promotes general prosperity, it promotes innovation, but they never show that it does. Mm -hmm. If you're really serious with this argument, why don't you do some research, try to come up with an argument and evidence to establish your case. Tell me how much benefit the economy has from patents and copyrights. What are the costs? What are the benefits? What's the net? Right. 
show how you know this. I feel sure that you're going to have people in your class that are uh, taking a, a, uh, accepting a different conclusion about IP than, than you do. But I sense that uh, they, too, could benefit and also make a contribution to the overall learning environment. Absolutely. Um, most, re- so I would say, reasonable people I speak with that I disagree with, um, when they think hard about these issues, they at least adopt a more reasonable position. Yeah, they say, well, right. yeah, they, they agree with you on most of the egregious examples, for example. Right. You know, they say, no, I'm not in favor of that. And if you get them to agree on all these uh, egregious examples, then what they end up being in favor of is a type of IP system that really wouldn't bother us that much. Yeah. Any, any more than a 1% tax would really be something that would be the main issue of the day. That's right. Right? They so, imagine um, themselves as the central planners constructing a, a, a certain kind of IP regime, actually. <laughs> yes. But, you know, people that take the course are, are free to disagree. This yeah. is an open forum. Um, um, uh, you know, this is not a, an orthodoxy or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's, this is my opinion, and but I'm going to give a lot of information that will allow people to make up their own minds. But the other thing about this, uh, Stefan, is that it's not one of these subjects that's so easy to quickly come to a conclusion about. It's not, it's not like, you know, uh, inheritance taxes or uh, imminent domain or these other subjects that you can kind of quickly think through and realize what is and isn't compatible it, with liberty. Not. This is a tough subject. It's tough. It took me a long time to uh, develop my views on it. I was a practicing patent and copyright lawyer at first, and I, I struggled for maybe a decade to try to find a way to justify it because I assumed it would be justified somehow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I kept running, running into walls, and finally, you know, the key, everything fell into place, primarily from Rothbard and Mazesian theory. Um, and, but I found this issue; it is difficult. But once you see it, it's one of these issues that um, sets people's minds on fire. It, yes. it, it frees you to yes. think about other things in different ways. It's like five or six other walls also fall yeah, your mind. Yeah, no, it's really true. On on topics that you already had a view on, right? And now it, you can see them in a different light. Yeah, that's right. Um, about economic theory and libertarian theory. Well, I, I think back too when I was uh, I recall reading a book years ago by Michael Novak, in which he was discussing economic development, and he said the reason why Britain and the U.S. advanced so rapidly was because uh, we had intellectual property. And other parts of the world did not. Right. And I read past that, and I thought, well, you know, that's interesting. Um, I don't recall reading that elsewhere. Right. I wonder if that's true. Now, this was maybe t- t- 10, 15 years ago I read this, but I couldn't, couldn't quite see what was where what where he had gone wrong, or if he had gone wrong. Right. You know. Um, that's a common argument that you hear all the time. That um, part of the empirical evidence for the uh, for the success of patents is that America has been a successful country. Right. right. Well, of course, that's uh, that's reversing cause and effect, or it's it's, uh, it's 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 just looking at correlation, right? Not causation. Yeah. I mean, we had slavery from the beginning. Yeah, that's we've, right. We've had we've had uh, free trade, uh, you know, tariffs and regulations, yeah. and or maybe it's the Mississippi River that. Uh, yeah, caused. I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, there's less, you know, I mean, of course, maybe we we would have been more prosperous without this, you know, yeah. for example. Yeah. In fact, I think we would have been. I yeah. think it was a mistake. I mean, the the founders put put this clause in the Constitution, um, and this is another thing we'll uncover too, yeah. which is fascinating. There's a common assumption that. Um, it's in the Constitution, therefore it's a natural right, and it was thought to be a natural right by the founders. Right. Well, of course it wasn't. Even Locke and the founders, none of them, none of them believed this was a natural yeah, right. Jefferson was 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 great on the topic. And they were they were queasy about this thing, but yeah. you know they'd seen attempts at this in Britain and other things. They thought, well, we'll do it for prudential reasons, just to encourage innovation. And I mean, also, it was a they they believed they're establishing it as an individual right rather than a right of the king. Correct. So they thought it was a liberalization right. of it's English law, democratization of, yeah. of IP or something like yeah, that. Correct. Right. Institutionalize it. Put it in the hands of a bureaucracy rather than at, at, at the political whim of a king. Yeah. Maybe that was an improvement in some ways, but now you institutionalize it, right? And you get you, you entrench this system. Um, but the the thing is, the founders and maybe you can't blame blame them. They were doing a lot at the time. They had a lot on their hands. They made an assumption. They assumed that this would be a net benefit for society. In any case, the laws were not agreed to back then. They were not. The, it was the like terms the one percent tax you refer. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. It wasn't that big a deal. Well, look, your your class went uh, live a couple of days ago. We were already hit with lots of registrations, so I know there's a 
uh, a great deal of interest in this. I look forward to the class very much, and I thank you for taking your time, uh, being willing to teach the class, and, and uh, being willing to sit down with me uh, today. Thank you very much.